Well, hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing, this time with um, the OpenShift Commons longtime members. Uh, Twistlock is going to talk about um, automated app defense, um, defending your applications on OpenShift. And we have Michael Withrow with us from Twistlock, who's been um, giving us talks before, so I'm looking forward to this one. And I'm going to let Michael take it away. We'll do live Q&A in the chat. If you have questions, please ask them, and we'll try and answer them. And then we'll have live Q&A at the end. So um, without any further ado, Michael, please take it away. All right. Thank you, Diane. And I also, just to let everybody know, so so just to carry on. So my name is Michael Withrow. I'm the Director of Customer Success here at Twistlock. I've also got Jeff Littlejohn, who's our VP of Business Deve, uh, Dev uh, here at Twistlock as well, uh, to help you here answer any questions as we're kind of going through. And so, like I said, uh, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, really, the idea here is to walk everybody through Twistlock and, and what we do as, as a product as we're going through. All right, and so as we start out, you know, what is Twistlock? Uh, so really, as you look at it from a capabilities point of view, uh, we provide automated lifecycle-based security from beginning of the lifecycle all the way through the end. So irregardless of, well, as you look at the entire Docker ecosystem, uh, as we go across all the different industries, all the different geos, uh, you see representation uh, across the entire ecosystem. We have many customers running Jenkins, many customers running Bamboo, Circle CI, Drone, Bitbucket, Team City, uh, all from a CI perspective. Uh, so we have many capabilities to integrate there. So think about it as, as automated integration of the build and not only alerting on the capabilities on build, but be able to restrict those builds based off vulnerability state, threat state, governance state, those kind of things like that. Um, and as we move forward, uh, you know, obviously we get into the CD portion of the conversation. That image gets, that artifact gets moved upstream into a registry out for the deployment. Uh, once again, there's a myriad of tools that exist from a registry perspective, you know, whether it's any one of the public clouds, uh, you know, from Google or Amazon or, uh, or, or um, AWS, uh, any of the uh, uh, private ones, Docker, DTR, Artifactory, Nexus, Quay, uh, you know, as you look from the OpenShift registry and those particular perspectives like that as you're getting through. And then, of course, from a deployment perspective, as you're kind of going through, obviously, this is very focused on, on OpenShift in that particular regard. Uh, you know, have an OpenShift cluster, you know, on-premise uh, multi-tenanted, whatever it might be, uh, having the ability to go into the deploy into there as you're, as you're kind of going through, which is really the, the, the premise of what we're going to talk about today as we're going through. And so skip through these as we, as we kind of go through. Uh, uh, really, as you look at it from a, a product perspective, we really focus off of a couple of key areas as you're going through. Uh, the base of the product and where we started out uh, is with an access control mechanism. And there is some some overlap with the uh, with the OpenShift capabilities there. I will talk about that as we go a little bit forward uh, from that good point. But then as you move up the stack, you can see that we have compliance capabilities, really those governance, those industry governance uh, settings. Think CIS, think NIST, think PCI, HIPAA, SOC, those kind of things like that when I'm talking compliance. We have all the vulnerability data. Like I said, not just vulnerability, but also threat data as we're kind of moving up. And then as you keep layering on, then we bring in, you know, a defense in depth, runtime defense as, we, as well as we're, as we're kind of going through. So as you go from static content over to metadata, essentially uh, introduce additional uh, uh, threat uh, protection vectors against those different attack uh, surfaces. And then rounding it out with cloud native firewalling capabilities that I'll talk through as we're going through. And so um, with that, um, I'll kind of get into the architecture and then um, I'll kind of uh, break it down uh, and I'll actually get into the product and show it through. And so how we do all of this, like I said, automatic, uh, automatic is the really uh, the, the key term as you're looking through from, a, from a, a capabilities point of view. At the rate of change that containers really bring into the marketplace, uh, there's really no matter how many bodies you throw at it, there's really not, not enough manual processes that you can kind of use to get in front of this. So, so automatic is the key way. And how we do this is we are just a set of containerized technology ourselves as you're kind of going through. You can see the console here, which is really just the front end of the product. It's where you basically set in a policy where you look at the audit data. It's where the CVE data gets pumped into the environment. 
is where you're building in all your alerting notifications, right? So as you're kind of going through, maybe you know you want to kick, maybe you have an existing Slack channel uh, or Jira ticketing or PagerDuty or something like that. Uh, you have all of your directory users coming in through Okta or AD or something like that, and then your native Splunk users or Sumo Logic or you know Cloud. Uh, uh, you know anything on one of the cloud vendors as you're kind of going through have an ability to do native uh, syslog integration as you're going through and really as you look at that that's the front end a singular entity uh, we have some ha capabilities obviously the ability uh, we provide a yaml file so you can deploy that right into openshift and so uh, openshift will manage the ha of the console as you're going through uh, with a pv uh, and obviously a, a yaml file for the pv and all that kind of stuff like that which i'll talk about in a second uh, as you kind of scale those things out then the point of enforcement uh, is really downstream on all the different nodes. So depending on how you build out your OpenShift cluster, right? So most of the time on an OpenShift cluster, uh, all the masters are not open for scheduling, right? As you're kind of going through, uh, but all your downstream infra and app nodes uh, across your different cluster, that's typically opened up uh, for, for scheduling where the pods are gonna actually get deployed. Uh, so what we're kind of talking about here is having the defenders any place where you're gonna install, uh, where you're gonna be running images and containers, right, as you're going through. So depending on how your OpenShift cluster is set up, will kind of help you dictate from an architectural footprint where the defenders need to be laid down to provide the automated protections that I'll be talking through as, as we're going through this presentation. And as you look at it, think of it as a privileged peered container uh, that runs like a proxy in the environment, which I'll talk uh, more a little bit through as, as we're going through. Uh, but that's really the first point. So that, that defender uh, is gonna be a point of presence on that particular node. Uh, as, as pods are deployed onto that node, it's gonna build the baseline, build the state, get all the configuration data. And then basically now it's a lifecycle based conversation. What's the drift off of that base? What's the drift off of that state as you're going through? So that's where the defender really becomes a critical part of the, of the architecture to really define that, that configuration. And then as I alluded to before, we also have the ability to extend well down into the CI CD pipeline process, right? And so uh, with, with plugins, uh, with, uh, we have an independent tool called a twist CLI. So depending on what you might be leveraging from a CI perspective, obviously in OpenShift, uh, you're running Jenkins, pipeline-based capabilities in Jenkins. Uh, that's a native capability for us, which I'll show as we kind of get through it uh, as we're going a little bit deeper. And then, uh, you know, your OpenShift registry, you have the ability to plug in your OpenShift registry, uh, you know, depending on how your topology is. Uh, there's some OpenShift customers that have a Nexus front end, which is wide open to the internet. Uh, we have the ability to plug in there. So as the developers uh, pull resources into there, we can start to build the state of the images in that Nexus registry for they're brought into the OpenShift registries inside the cluster. Uh, whatever that topology might look like, uh, we have a lot of different ways to plug into, into those uh, because we are agnostic uh, from, from that particular footprint and so so with that um uh, what i'll do is now i'm going to get out of the presentation side and i will go through and uh really kind of get into the product as we're going through all right so we bring this over and maximize this out and so um as you look at it uh, the key things to really understand is that uh, as, you, as you look at it, here's the front end. And so as you look at those defenders I was talking about before, uh, the defenders being installed across the environment is what's really starting to build out your baseline as you're going through. So I can see here's the baseline of my running containers. As I can see, as I look through, uh, you know, I can see which ones are internet connected, what the inbound, uh, what the ingress and egress is across my different containers, uh, whether they're behind a firewall, what the port structure is, what the vulnerability state, uh, all those particular things like that are. I see the overall compliance state, the overall vulnerability state of those resources as I'm going through. And so essentially, as you look at it from, from our point of view, how we essentially do that is because by default, uh, we really are built off of policy, which is all set onto alerting, which is really what builds that state as you're kind of going through uh, all that stuff's defined as you're going through. And then as you look through, uh, we make it really simple to go through, in your case, uh, you know, to go through from an OpenShift perspective to add in the registries, all going to be V2-based registries. You're going you're gonna to put in your, you know, customer dot, uh, you know, OSE.registry, whatever that might be, you're going to add that in there. 
um, and then whatever your credentials are to, uh, in order to get into that registry, uh, you're going to define it there as you're going through. And then so from that point, as, as images are built or stuffed in the registry, obviously we can go through and start giving uh, the state of those images in that registry, as you can kind of see here as we're going through. And I'll talk through those a little bit deeper as we're going through. And, and the key there is that essentially the defenders which are deployed across the environment and deployed across the OpenShift environment have a set of binaries in there, which are uh, there for the purposes of conducting a static image analysis, right? And so that's the key term when we're talking about images as they exist, uh, as they move through the life cycle as you're going through. And obviously as you get onto the Jenkins side, right? So what I have here is a real simple uh, pipeline based uh, build to kind of show the configuration as we're going through. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, this is just a real simple build out, but it shows the flow is that somewhere, no matter how simple or complex that build process is, somewhere is an artifact of actually doing a Docker build, right? To be fair enough, it could be a Docker pull, but at the end of the day, there is an image artifact that we're looking for. And we are typically the next step to go through and scan that that particular image as it's moving through the pipeline right so like I said an on build capability that we're going through so now as you look at it there's a couple of real key things that are really really important as you're kind of going through and you kind of see here a couple of different warns that we have here the base behavior is obviously to warn right so depending on what your ci pipeline process looks like what level of enforcement you're trying to roll through we allow you to toggle that that setting uh, all the way up the line um, as you're going through. So, so for the vulnerability state, maybe I want to warn on high or critical only, right, as an example, or maybe I'm worried about all, so I want to do low as an example, or whatever that is, I can set that up. And so obviously, if there's any low vulnerabilities in there, we're going to trip that entire build um, and kick that back to the developer to remediate all those low base vulnerabilities. Warn just allows me to get that state, know what's going on, so I can move it up. And depending on how I want to build that pipeline, we give you the flexibility to tune that to whatever you need. And what's really unique here is that we also do the same thing on the governance side, right? So obviously we're talking about governance from an image perspective because there's not any metadata, all those kind of things like that. So think CIS benchmarks, which I'll talk about in a second at, or like a couple minutes as we're going through. But really there's a base set of confines that really say, hey, look, on an image, best practices is running as root, set comp profile, you know, those kind of things like that. Um, really as a base layer, as I'm building that image, obviously at a static level, uh, what governance settings would trip up if I'm trying to deploy this into a PCI environment or a SOC or a HIPAA or whatever it might be type of environment downstream. So you have a lot of control for how you would affect that. We have some customers that block on CI, but allow on CD. We have some customers that allow on CI and block on CD as you're kind of going upstream, right? From, from that to the respective. The key thing to understand though, is, is what we're really talking about is those same set of binaries that I was talking about in the Defender, uh, the Jenkins plugin has those same set of binaries, right? So the experience is the same. And what we're really talking about from a capabilities point of view is that anywhere across the life cycle where an image can actually live, we have the ability to plug in from a binary level and can perform a static analysis off of that image as we're going through. And so, so as you look at it, what we're really talking about when we talk about that static analysis is that as we're going through, we really look, like I said, depending on the state of the image, we really look at it from two different perspectives. You know, this image on this particular build, you know, did have a couple of compliance hit. Like I said, it was running at root uh, as an example, just to kind of show a couple of different flavors in there, you know, just a simple health check based violation uh, that exists there. But obviously these can take many different forms, but just to kind of show as a base layer, what this kind of looks like is what you'll see here. And then as we go across, like I said, this the cool part about this, this is exactly what the developer experience is going to be like. Uh, all this stuff's defined here as we're kind of going through. And so um, as we're going through, um, as you look through it, now we have all the base vulnerabilities that exist here, right, as we're going through. And so all the different details are going to be displayed back to the developer. So if you warned that build or you failed that build off, the developer would know why that build was failed off, right, and what remediation steps 
are, are need to be taken place in order to move that build upstream as you're going through. And so as you look at that a little bit deeper, obviously we have the ability to look at the images uh, in the registry as well. And we have the ability to look at um, the images as they move from the registry and are deployed out in the environment as well. And now you have an image injected into a container that's running in a pod that's on a node inside of your OpenShift cluster, right? So what we're talking about is the ability to affect the, what images can actually get propagated in, but now a clean image has got deployed in your environment and now vulnerabilities exist, right? What kind of happens? Uh, how do we notify that there that's coming through? And so as you look at it, uh, we break that process down a little bit deeper. Uh, what you're really looking at is as we get into here, uh, let me click that off. Uh, why is that not clicking? Um, sorry about that. There we go. Uh, just being a little slow. Sorry about that. Um, as we kind of go through. And so uh, what we're really talking about is that from a static perspective, uh, the first part of the conversation is that we're going through here and clicking on the layers, right? And so with the layers is that's really where we start out from a static analysis perspective is really going through and say, hey, look, you know, this image has 23 layers. It's basically right at about a gig as I'm going through. So a couple of different problems uh, from that perspective. I did hear a chat coming in there. So let me back up and I did hear a chat. So make sure I count for the chat. Okay. And so, Diane, if it makes sense, um, yeah, what I'll say is just to catch up, um, um, as we're going through, uh, if there's any questions, please just jump in and interject on the questions that's kind of going through. And I will say that right now, my console is not running on the dashboard, but let me show you something. Uh, my dashboard is not running on OpenShift, uh, but I do have an OpenShift node here. And then a couple of things that we have, so I didn't have a chance to build it up before we got finished out, but you'll see here, um, let me back up and kind of talk through uh, the actual deployment if that makes sense. Then I'll circle back to the actual vulnerability stuff that we're doing. That's perfect. And, yeah, perfect. So, so if we catch up, right? So what we're talking about is that um, as we go through, the console is gonna be the, the first thing that you're gonna actually, actually deploy as you're kind of going through. And so the first real requirement that we have is obviously a per persistent volume. So you can kind of see here that we have this persistent volume.yaml file, right, as we're kind of going through. And so this is the first thing you're going to build as we're kind of going through. You can see here the name of the file. Uh, the label gets really important because we're talking about really binding uh, the, the pod to this particular uh, PV. And so we create a PVC, a persistent volume claim. Uh, that binds and it uses that label is really how we bind it as we're going through and then the path as we're going through so depending on how your your storage construct is or whatever it is uh, here we're using the host path as you're going through uh, obviously the important part about this is by default um, host path implementation is 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 set to restricted so there's a couple of different ways you can do that. Uh, we actually have the logic inside of our YAML file to actually build out an SCC to re relax the host path implementation uh, setup, which I'll show you in a second. But depending on this, you're gonna set your host path of where the PV is actually gonna be mounted. And then uh, from natural perspective, then as you go through, so now I'm going to do an OC git uh, PV, and you can see, uh, oh, I got to, oh, I got to set my config file. So as I go through, so I want to do a sudo su uh, from natural perspective. So I want to do an OC git PV uh, from natural perspective, and you can see here that we have a twist log PV that's bound, right, from natural perspective. So I can do an OC uh, describe uh, PV twist log. Uh, from that perspective, you can get further details about how that's actually set up, which all that was defined um, in the in the uh, YAML file that was built there. And then once that's there, uh, as you look through, the next thing we have is essentially the twistlock console.yaml. So as you look at this, uh, twistlock console.yaml. Uh, um, as we're going through, you'll see here a couple of different things. We have a config map, which is really uh, the Docker file that's going to be built for the image, uh, which is all the, the constructs for the, the Twistlock console itself around the port structure, all that stuff like that. And as you can see in here, as we're going through, uh, a couple of the key things, depending on how the names, uh, namespaces are constructed, 
Uh, do we need to build services and routes and all that kind of stuff like that? If you deploy the console and the defenders in the same namespace, you don't really need to think about services and ports and all that kind of stuff like that. But if you do, depending on what your business criteria is, do need to segment, we provide those services and port examples in the config file as you're going through. And then as I alluded as well, uh, we actually build out an SCC for you, a security context constraint uh, file named Twistlock Console. And you'll see that the first thing it does is it toggles uh, the basically allow host dir volume plugin to true. Because as a base layer inside of OpenShift, um, the restricted um, the restricted SCC is going to be kicked in, uh, which has basically the volume plugin set to false, right? So essentially, uh, there's a couple different ways you can relax it. the the least uh, the least uh, the least intrusive way is to create an SCC around that, or you can just modify restricted, which I wouldn't recommend as you're kind of going through. So that's essentially the reason we build this out as you're kind of going through. Uh, we don't run uh, we don't run as privilege those kind of things like that. Uh, the console is a least privileged container as you're kind of going through. So really the host path is really the only thing that you kind of kind of uh, worry about as you're setting that. And we do specify that um, inside of the YAML file as you're going through. And so, so as you look at it as we're going through, you, now you see the claim and that label becomes really important uh, as you saw back in the PV. Here's where the PVC actually is, which allows that to actually be bound as we're going through. And so from that particular perspective, then you'll see the base port structure if you need to do it there. Um, off, uh, and that, that particular point as you're going through. And those are really the big things that you have uh, as we're kind of going through. You'll see the data volume there. Uh, we do specify all of this stuff depending on what the registry is. Uh, if it, you know, typically on an OpenShift deployment, everybody's using their OpenShift registry. So the exercise is, is taking the, uh, the image for the console, putting in the OpenShift registry, and then specifying the path for it uh, here in the, in, the, in the YAML file as you're going through. And so um, as we go through, uh, the idea there from, from that particular point is that now we can actually run the YAML file as we're going through. I did run into a problem with that, but just kind of give you a, a base example as we're going through. That's when I was working through some permission stuff on the back end. Uh, that's why I was, I was really close to having it up and running. I apologize from that particular perspective. Here is my, uh, basically my OpenShift cluster as we're kind of going through. And then on that particular perspective, I do have the console running off the YAML file. I just had some syntax problems. I didn't quite get a chance to, to flush out before um, uh, this particular briefing is going through. But that's the first thing as you're kind of going through uh, to have that base set up and then get the console deployed. Obviously, now you have the ability to browse the console, which you would kind of see here, which this is just running on a Docker environment. But um, I do have a raw Kubernetes environment, which obviously OpenShift is built off of as well. The base is really the same. Uh, the Twistlock console is the Twistlock console, whether it's installed natively on the Docker daemon uh, or it's installed as a pod inside of a cluster as you're kind of going through. Uh, as you'll go through, it'll be served up on some network port, uh, some availability is built out, and then you have it there. So to complete that circle as we're going through, once uh, you have the console deployed, uh, we have uh, now the next thing is to build out the build out the daemon set as you're going through. And so you can see here uh, we have a couple of different ways. So depending on uh, how your um, depending on what your network topology is, all that stuff like that, you'll build this out here, uh, which really says, hey, look, which um, which resource. Uh, you know, what is the, uh, the networking connectivity for how the defenders are going to connect back to the console as you're going through. So you would define all this out as you're going through. Typically, what I usually always tell, tell customers to do is as you're going through, um, I want to do an OC get SVC, right, from that to the perspective. And then I'm going to grab that cluster IP uh, from that to the perspective. I'm going to grab that. I'm going to go in the Twistlock console and I'm going to add a row right, from that perspective, and then add that. And then now, as I do my deployments of the daemon set, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab that cluster IP, go through OpenShift, um, I'm gonna set the Unix socket, I'm gonna do Docker, and then of course I'm gonna do whatever my registry is. And so, so customer.ose.registry.com, uh, um, uh, right? 
right? Colon 5,000, right, as an example. And typically, um, from, from that particular point, if, um, if it's an OpenShift registry, that typically means that you need a secret to communicate with it, right? And so that's one of the things we define in the config file as well. Sorry about that, I closed that out. But having in the config file uh, the secret, and so twist lock dash console or whatever it is, right? Have that secret there. And then this output there is the YAML file, right? Uh, for that. And then essentially now I have a daemon set.yaml. Uh, and then you can kind of see here as an example, this is on my Kubernetes box as I go through just to show a couple different places because I didn't get that far in the implementation. But to show you, um, as we go through this YAML file, uh, the, the construct is the same. This is uh, based off of Kubernetes, but as you're going through, really the big thing that you account for and want to make sure is set is this WSS address, right? So that's essentially that path that I was talking about for the defender to be able to communicate back with the console as you deploy it downstream on your nodes. The def uh, and then of course the defender is going to communicate bi-directionally over a TLS communication over port 8084. So this is essentially setting that daemon set, and then now you build the daemon set out. Now you let the OpenShift cluster manage the availability uh, of your res of your defenders across your nodes. So as you add in new nodes, take away nodes, the daemon set accounts for all that and automates that process as you're going through. Makes sense? Any other questions? Okay, good. I'll just monitor that periodically as we're going through. And so as you look at it, really what we're talking about is that we really give you three artifacts. Uh, an artifact for the persistent volume, a YAML file for the PV, um, uh, and then a YAML file for the console, and a YAML file for the daemon set uh, that allows you to integrate uh, TwistLock into your cluster and have it as a cluster managed entity as you're going through. Makes sense? Any questions for the group? I'll take that and I'll pause there. I know we're about halfway through and just if there's any questions, please come off mute and hit me up directly. Yeah, so at the, the one question I might have is on the TwistLock website, where is the best place to find the documentation um, walking us through what you've just shown us deploying? Perfect, no, great, great segue. And so as you look through, um, as you're going through from, from our particular perspective, uh, right on our TwistLock console, uh, we have, uh, say, learn more about this feature. So depending on where you're at in the UI, we have this page you click here, and it's going to auto-log you on and take you right to the corresponding document, right? And so there's, there it is. Basically, any questions you have about setting up the daemon set deployment, you would walk through that, do that document there as you're kind of going through. And so if you had questions about the console, um, I could go into here in a search. This is all search-enabled field. And you can see all the different ways we have going through and installing the console as it's going through. To be completely fair, one thing that we are working on, Diane, and for everybody in the community to be aware is that obviously you see all of our documentation today is very specific to Kubernetes. Yes. Um, obviously, that is a pre precursor to OpenShift because it's sitting on top of that. So one thing that we are doing is that essentially we right now we have inside of the documentation we do have um, uh, we do have representation for o OC create as an example as we're going through. So if you're on Kubernetes, run a kube create. But if you're on OpenShift, run an OC create as we're going through. But we're going to be even more descriptive than that. We have an actually an action item. We are, it's actually something we're working on right now. We're going to build out separate documentation. So if you're doing an OpenShift deployment, you would type in OpenShift in on the search bar, and essentially would pump out all the document for the the, the persistent volume for the console for the the daemon set for OpenShift. You're running on Kubernetes. You would type in Kubernetes and it would bring out the document. So right now it all predicates off Kubernetes, but we are segmenting that out. Uh, here really, really soon in our next release. All right. From cool. a documentation perspective. Thank you for that. No, good. So thanks for, I should have done that first. I apologize. I went right into how it was running instead of how you should deploy it. So that was on me as you kind of going through. But like I said, what I, I hopefully you take away from this is that we make it really, really easy to, to generate the YAML files and execute the YAML files to deploy the product. So most customers not having any precursory knowledge of the product can de deploy this uh, uh, really, really uh, seamlessly uh, by integration with your DevOps teams, those kind of things like that as you're going through. All right, and so now kind of carrying it on, if there's no other questions about deployment, setup, architectures you're going through, now I'll kind of spend the next half an hour kind of getting a little bit deeper into what we bring now that you've got TwistLock deployed across your OpenShift cluster, 
what we provide from a uh, topology perspective, from a view perspective, and from a restriction perspective as we're going through. All right. And so as you look at this a little bit deeper, going back to where I was at before, um, really what we're talking about when we do the static analysis is really breaking down the different layers that exist in the image for the purposes of generating a bill of materials. And so here we have the bill of materials for the particular image uh, that exists, which becomes the artifact based off of the SHA as that image moves through the life cycle, right? And what's really unique about us as well is that, you know, hey, we know developers are building jar files, tar files, war files, zip files, NPM files, and injecting them into images. Uh, we have the ability to crack those open, looking for binary executables within. Uh, we see that, we'll actually link them here as we're going through. Notice we have some licensing components, not enforcement, but alerting as we're going through. That stuff's defined. Uh, all for the purposes of knowing what to link vulnerability data to. And this is what gets into the lifecycle portion of the conversation. Now that we have that bill of materials, whether we uh, develop that bill of materials in the CI, in CD, or out and running, someone skipped the entire CI process, does a Docker pull on a, on a node, right? Right from Docker IO as an example. We can generate that bill of materials and do all the corresponding alerting, notification, all that kind of stuff like that that exists. But the base as we go through is, now that we have that bill of materials, now we can start basically linking in vulnerability data as we're going through. And so, um, as you look at it, uh, uh, the really the cool part about it is that we have a SaaS service. And really, when you look at the SaaS service, it's a real-time intelligent CVE streaming service, which does normalization of content in over 30 different providers. Right, so as you look at it from, from your perspective, you, you know, you're running RHEL or Atomic and you're deploying RHEL-based images uh, in your environment and all that's propagated through. So at, all those feeds are gonna be pulled in uh, and then we actually are purpose-built to go through. Because when I say we're 30 different providers, you know, one thing that we do that's unique is we, we pull from NIST, the NVD database. We also pull from the RHEL oval feed. We pull from all the different uh, distro oval feeds. We pull all the different language oval feeds. We pay for uh, certain uh, vulnerability data. Uh, we have partnerships with Proofpoint to give us our IP and malware content. We have a partnership with a zero-day malhunter company called Exodus, which gives us our zero-day content as we're going through. And so now uh, what we do is we pump machine learning into here. And so essentially what we're talking about is making intelligent decisions about which source uh, uh, from which vendor uh, we want to port in for this particular package in this particular image at this point of the life cycle as you're going through, right? Um, as things are coming, because CVs get posted all the time in real time or near real time, depending on the SLAs of the oval feed, those kind of things like that. That's why I want to be very descriptive when I say whether it's real time or near real time as we're going through. But now that you have that data as we're going through, like I said, all this information we pumped in, we're going through and sourcing in the most accurate information that we can uh, based off of, uh, off of that feed data that's coming in. So we're not pulling from one or two sources and doing a raw dump. We're actually intelligently looking through that feed data and figuring out which is the most accurate source to pull in. You can see here, I'm running a CentOS based image. There's the SHA, all stuff like that. You know, when I pull off this particular package, that particular package is right off of NIST NVD, right? As I'm kind of going through. But as I go downstream in other packages, that conversation is different, right? You can see here, this is actually off the Red Hat feed, right? Because for that particular, that particular package, the most accurate source was the Red Hat feed as we're going through. And so depending on the package, depending on the information, uh, depending on which packaging we're going to be sourcing in, you can kind of see we went over to SNCC uh, for this particular information to pull in uh, particular informa information information about this particular package as we're going through. So very, very sourced, very purpose-built, uh, really focused on remediating the false positives, all those kind of things like that as we're going through. And so as you look at it, really the idea and the premise uh, and, and, and the, the really the purpose here is to build the baseline. Good, bad, or indifferent, you have the baseline of your environment, right? And that's essentially what this dashboard is giving you is that baseline as we're going through. Um, but we don't stop there as you're going through. We give the baseline of your host layer as well. Uh, so you're running those RHEL-based hosts. Um, we're going to give you the vulnerability and the compliance state of those. Essentially the same way we do with the images. We're going to basically build out that bill of materials, and now we know what vulnerability and compliance data uh, to link in there as you're going through. 
And then so what we what we do next from that perspective is we have another layer of analytics, right? So, hey, thanks, Twistlock. You told me I have a thousand vulnerabilities, right? Uh, what do I even do with that data, right, as an example? So as you look at like our explorers, really the explorers are really, like I said, pumping in analytics to give you some, some really uh, direction for remediation. And so as you look here, you know, here's the particular CVE, maybe it's a low or a medium or a critical CVE, but what's more important is where is that CVE actually propagated? And so here's the configuration data for the propagation of that CVE. Here I can see here's the image, here's the container, here's the host. Image, container, host. This is just an image, not actually deployed in a container anywhere. But as I look across, these containers are all in different states. This one is actually exposed on the internet, running as root, running a high sex CVE. This actually represents the most uh, risk to my organization. That's why it's ranked number one. This one I probably want to remediate first as I'm going through. And then we give you all of that data as, as we go through. So they can propagate that out. You know, all that stuff's gonna be deployed as I'm kind of going across. Uh, this particular container has a couple of different infractions on it. So if I remediate them, this is the one that represents the most risk. And this is a bubbling up type of topology, right? I remediate one, two becomes one, 11 becomes 10 as we're going through until you've remediated all those, those risks that exist out there. You can see the, the CVs change because it's the combination of the two entities which dictate that risk, right? The CVE and the containers actually deployed in uh, dictates that risk factor as you're kind of going through. But as I talked about in Jenkins as well, as this gets in the remediation portion of the conversation, but I told you before, we also affect the CI CD pipeline process. So as I talked about in Jenkins, we have the ability to not only to warn, but to affect and block images that, that violate the, the vulnerability threshold or the governance threshold. Uh, that's on the CI portion of the conversation. When you get into the CD portion of the conversation, we provide blocking mechanisms here as well um, as you look through. So maybe um, on, your inf uh, on your infrastructure nodes or your app tier of your, of your OpenShift cluster, um, what was built, right? So maybe a developer builds a clean image and that image gets posted to your OpenShift registry, but now that image has been sitting in the registry for a day or a week or two weeks, and now it's got vulnerabilities on there, right? Uh, maybe you miss the alerting notification and someone just, and OpenShift picks it up and tries to do a deployment off of that, right? So now you just be basically have, you know, carte blanche through orchestration deploying uh, basically a vulnerable image as a pod in your container. What we're basically saying here is I can actually block that topology as I'm kind of going through. You can set the threshold uh, as I'm kind of going about. I have a lot of granularity for what type of thresholds I want to define across what entities. And then I can get very prescriptive for where I deploy that. Uh, what's very common when you look at OpenShift topologies is multiple customers have multiple swim lanes for their OpenShift clusters. Maybe, you know, one, one, two, three, or maybe five downstream pre-prod based clusters, and then maybe a, uh, a single or multiple pre-production uh, clusters, because maybe one cluster is PCI, another cluster is HIPAA, or whatever that, that setup might be. We have the ability to segment policy across those resources as we're going through. So I can go through here and basically add in all my nodes. Maybe this is a five node cluster, right? Um, uh, I can add them in individually, node one, node two, whatever it might be as I'm kind of going through. But that's really where the labels come in because everything in pre-prod is gonna be, you know, customer dot pre dot, you know, whatever it is. And I'm gonna do a star. And now I've just sucked in the entire cluster um, into that particular policy, and I've basically defined a posture for that cluster, right? So as I'm going through. And what's very, very common is customers use the policy setup to basically tier out their environment. So as I'm going through, so I can define, hey, look, from a vulnerability perspective, upstream or downstream, I should say, I want to be notified all the way through. I, mean, I just want to be alerted to vulnerability states all the way through dev, all the way through pre-prod. But when I get to production, there should be no, uh, there should be no surprises. There should be no drift. I want to block vulnerabilities from actually being run there in production as I'm kind of going through. And that's a normal type of setup that customers actually have deployed uh, with our product uh, as, they're, as they're going through. All right, make sure there's not any other questions as I'm kind of going through. But that gets into the other part of the product uh, from actually the perspective. 
Uh, we do a native dump into syslog. So from an OpenShift perspective, you know, OpenShift's writing into the syslog feed. Uh, we do a same, we do a write-in facility one of syslog as well. So if you're already doing uh, dumps from a syslog perspective into a sim off of your OpenShift setup, uh, we can tie natively into that and then give you the audit data off of the OpenShift nodes as well as the pods and containers and images up above as well as you're going through. Maybe you have a Slack channel or JIRA for a ticketing perspective, or you have SMTP, we have the ability to integrate there and then segment not only what avenue the, the, uh, the data is getting pumped out, but who do you want to send that data to, what type of data do you want to send them, and at what frequency do you want to send that data. With me so far? That's great. Actually, that was the one question I had was, where's the alerting and all of this stuff? So you can yeah. just... Yeah, and that was where I was wanted to get to this point and kind of dump through is give you a basic example of vulnerabilities and then how how do you operationalize this, right? And that, that's really the key term as you look through it is what do you do with this data, right? It's one thing for us to give you all the data, but how do you actually use it? What do you actually do with it, right? And that's that's the premise of how I wanted to really tailor this. So as you look at it, this product is not designed uh, or, or nor is it needed for you to live in here all day, every day as you're kind of going through. So that's what the alerting, uh, we're a REST API based product. Uh, we have all the alerting notification through the defenders and through the, the configuration data, through the, the policy, we're going to build a lot of information about your particular environment. And now you kind of build through Twistlock, say, how do I want to distribute that information, right? As a, as a developer builds an image and that image has vulnerabilities, I want to be notified of that. If somebody posts an image that has vulnerabilities, I want to be notified about that. I have a production image that is clean or a production pod that is clean, but now a zero day just hit it. I want to be notified, right? All that stuff like that is really how we're built out as you're going through. And so you set your email chain and now a zero day hits, boom, boom, X, Y, and Z, people get notified. Or a developer posts an image that has these vulnerabilities, boom, X, Y, and Z, uh, people get notified as you're going through. You don't have to live in the console and then waiting for an alert, all that kind of stuff like that. Off of the alert, we build the notification and cascade it downstream. Make sense? All right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's great. All right. We do the same things on the governance side, right? Just like I talked about as well. Uh, what's really cool here as you go through, uh, we uh, as a company, Twistlock as a company, uh, have really made a couple of key contributions to the ecosystem. Uh, one around CIS, not only CIS for Docker, but CIS for Kubernetes, right? So those are native to the product. Here's all the Docker configs and here's all the Kubernetes configs. So as you deploy your, your uh, OpenShift cluster, we're gonna help you maintain the baseline of that, that topology, right? As you're kind of going through, right? Uh, all from a security point of view, as you're kind of going through. So you can see here about 300, almost 400 plus checks are here out of the box as you're kind of going through. And we also have the ability to extend, right? So whether it's through OpenSCAP, Red Hat uh, has an OpenSCAP capability. Uh, mm -hmm. As you kind of see here, uh, here's an OpenSCAP XML that we kind of built out. And a lot of customers are using this to get very application centric. Think I want to build, this is really saying, hey, look, I don't want to deploy privileged containers. I don't want running as root. I don't want the ability to SSH, those kind of things like that. But more granular would say, hey, look, I want to make sure my developers are building an application on this Linux family with this version of the application, with this port structure exposed, with this permission set on this user and this permission set on this file system, as an example. Um, those are certain things where certain customers are starting to leverage us as well, and how they're doing that is through OpenSCAP. And so essentially we have native capabilities in here to go through, through SCAP, and upload data streams as I kind of go through. So I can go through here, add in a data stream, and maybe I want to pick up um, as I'm kind of going through maybe the the op the, the sample um, the sample uh, DSS uh, streams that exist out there. I can build those out and add those in and enforce those topologies as well as we're kind of going through. Uh, that was the reason I couldn't delete it is because essentially it was being used as we're kind of going through. But as you look at it uh, simply enough, really what we do is allow you to not only alert on the posture, but block the deployment of images that uh, into pods that violate these postures, 
right? So I can define what I want to do if a host has these settings, right? If the master is deployed as an RPM or as a container, obviously which settings would apply would be important, but we've got it covered from both perspectives as we're going through and saying here, and now we can go through and say, hey, look, this is what my master has to look like when I deploy it. This is what my API server, my worker nodes, what they look like, what communication structure they have, uh, all that kind of stuff like that is defined. If I'm doing federation, which is upstream from that to the perspective, not a lot of customers are doing federation yet, but we're starting to see an uptick of federation. I'm pretty sure that OpenShift supports federation, Diane. You have to keep me honest on that one uh, from, from that to the perspective, but that's all defined there as you're kind of going through. All right. So pivoting off of that, as you look at vulnerabilities and compliance, really just think that these really, those two constructs are really there to um, define your CI, CD portion of the product, right? So really handling your static base content. So now as we move upstream, that's where access control comes in, runtime and firewalls. Um, I won't talk about access control today because uh, selfish, uh, selfish a plug there. Uh, we actually wrote the, uh, the um, basically an Auth-Z plugin to the Docker daemon itself on the open source side. It's actually what OpenShift leverages to provide the access control mechanisms there. So essentially, it's uh, basically it's a feature parity there as you look between what, how we do access control and how OpenShift does access control because uh, they're using the same engine underneath, so to speak, uh, from, from a plug-in perspective. But really starting out as we kind of go through, now uh, we've gone through and we've secured our CI CD pipeline process. We've got refined how images actually get built, how images get deployed. Now, the only thing we're really concerned with is drift off of that setup as we're kind of going through, which is really as a base is how uh, runtime is built out. How we do this is, is automatically through modeling, right? As an example, as we're going through. And so what we really have, as you look at it, uh, the Defender, which is sitting on all your OpenShift nodes, is leveraging Auth-Z as plumbing down into the kernel. Right, and essentially we have some sensors that we drop down in the kernel uh, from, from actual perspective, so we can, is essentially record and listen to transactions that traverse those sensors. Right, and so when you get into orchestration and restriction of orchestration, and someone bypasses, think someone elevates out of the orchestration engine, tries to do something through that conduit, is really how we restrict, alert, notify all those particular things like that. Um, if you, you know, obviously this is the 200 level view and those things like that, but if you want to get a little bit deeper, you can reach out to us directly. That's where you can reach out to Jeff at Twistlock and we can, you know, schedule a further on deep dive uh, from match the perspective uh, to really talk through from a binary level how this really works. But the base that I want you to walk around and understand is that at a very native level, we integrate with OpenShift, we integrate with the daemon itself. So as Open, OpenShift tries to do a deployment, depending on how you set your CI CD pipeline process, we have the ability to uh, set a threshold at your discretion as you're going through. And now, as you look at it, right, uh, once a container is deployed, uh, think of us as going into record mode. All these sensors, a process sensor, a network sensor, a file system sensor, a system call sensor uh, goes into record mode. And we're looking at two base things. Static is first and foremost. Obviously, we got that from the Docker file but behavioral is all that metadata. Now that the container's up and running, what is it actually doing? And so at a base level, here's what processes you're allowed to vote, invoke, here's what network calls you're allowed to make, here's what file system transactions and system call transactions you're allowed to make. We do the same thing on the host layer, right? We provide that runtime protection on the host layer, right? There's the child processes, all that stuff like that as I go through, notice the behavioral, content that's defined there. Once we have that that meta once we have that model, essentially everything that happens off the back end of that, we generate an audit because the premise of the models is to generate to grab the operational intent. So obviously malicious is part of that, right? But it's not the only thing we look at. This container's purpose in life is to run Jenkins. If it's all of a sudden run Tomcat entities or Mongo entities or something like that, that is outside of the intent. We are going to let you know. But these can get rather noisy as you're kind of going through, right, from an actual perspective. And so that's essentially what Incident Explorer is, another set of analytics from that to the perspective. We have a set of, uh, uh, we have a set of algorithms that comb through those audit trails looking for trends 
and anomalies, right, of a malicious intent and pulling them out as incidents, right? So you can see an example kill chain here. Here's the entire forensic trail of what actually transpired. See, so someone came in, made a system call, which did a file system right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can see there's 16 steps in this kill chain. But as I go down, you know, here's a more complex one. This is 92 step kill chain as we're going through. All this is defined through file system rights, network calls, all that stuff like that is gonna be defined here as we're going through. The key thing to really think about here is essentially any one of these actions by themselves don't necessarily dictate a kill chain or a trend. It's the, it's the collective of them together is what actually builds that out. Then we'll actually look north and south of that event, look for other things in that field, and that's how we build you know, kill chains, botnet attacks, Trojan horse attacks, um, X, SQL injection attacks, you know, XSS-based attacks, DDoS, you know, all that stuff like that is, is the kind of things uh, that we're looking through. And so obviously the base behavior is that we are alerting to this behavior. Um, but we really bring in uh, a base set of capabilities uh, that to get more granular in how you react to that as well. And so what we have is notice this prevent button. And so now that we've defined that whitelist, right, um, if anything happens outside of that whitelist, do you want to be alerted and notified of that? Do you want to block it or do you want to prevent it? Right. So obviously block means to kill the container, kill the pod. And obviously from an OpenShift perspective, if we kill a pod, OpenShift is going to try to spin that back up. In blocking, we actually kill it and put it into a forensic state to prevent that, that redeploy uh, from an OpenShift perspective. But so that's obviously really, really intrusive. What's more impactful and more useful is really the prevent button. We know what process it was supposed to invoke. If something gets invoked on the container that's not on this list, we want to block that process. We want to block that file system, right? Or we want to block that network packet as we're going through. And I know we have about six minutes left, so I'll close it out with the firewalls and then open it up for Q&A in the last couple of minutes. So the key thing I want to leave you with is that on the runtime side, uh, we really give you in-depth data about what's actually transpired outside of from a modeling perspective, what changed on your model, and then give you meaningful ways about how you react to that, right? Do I want to do alerting and notification or do I want to actually block it, right? So as you look here, you know, here's our WAF as an example. We're building out more additional capabilities as we're going through. Um, I have a real simple rule here to say, hey, look, I want to block the ability for anybody to, uh, to basically talk to this web page via a browser, right? So an all or nothing kind of uh, scenarios I'm going through. So I can set this to blocks real quick real quick if I go here, and now we just kicked in real dynamically and blocked that particular container from going through. All the while, as I go through, um, you can see here a Docker PS, if I could type right, uh, the Jenkins container uh, never went down, right? As I'm kind of going through, oh, I'm on the wrong box, that's why. Uh, I gotta go through, here we go. So I can do a Docker PS, and you can see there, my Jenkins container is up and running as I'm kind of going through. It's been up for six days, right? So I can simply go over here, set this back, and actually set that to alert, go through, and then refresh. And then that now I'll let the packets traverse to come through, right? So we never actually killed the container. We just blocked those packets. So as you look here, we have the ability to do that from a layer seven perspective, as well as a layer three perspective. What's really cool here is we look through on the layer three perspective, we know through modeling from a static and a behavioral perspective, what the network transactions are, right? Whether it's a Docker Compose, uh, you have certain pods that are supposed to communicate with each other. We know all that through the modeling, right? Now, do you want to prevent any uh, drift off of that or do you want to alert those kind of things like that? So now from a layer three perspective, now all of a sudden 8084 is only allowed inbound, but if all of a sudden somebody makes a uh, port 80 call back, what do we want to do with that? Do we want us to be alerted to that or do we want to prevent that, that packet from actually traversing across? All right. So um, I know I can go a lot deeper from a natural perspective. I went right up to the end. <laughs> um, I'll kind of open up for Q&A on the last couple of minutes. <laughs> well, I, I think you've done a, a really good job doing this. If you could share um, your contact information. Do you have a slide there so that if people are trying to get a hold of you? Um, yeah, so what I'll say is it's Michael at at twistlock.com and Jeff at twistlock.com. Right. Why don't you go to the Twistlock um, website too, just and and maybe bring up the um, that Kubernetes deployment um, 
page. Uh, oh, you're talking about on the documentation from, from documentation, your perspective. So that when, if someone's watching that, yeah, that's probably a really good place for folks to start. Yeah. Um, yep, as, as you're going through. Yep, absolutely. So that would be where I would, would ask people to, to come and find out how to get started on all of this and install everything. I, I think you did a pretty amazing job um, covering off almost every aspect of this. So uh, there aren't any questions. Um, I'll give people a few more minutes to ask any questions they might have. But um, as soon as you get your OpenShift specific documentation done, let me know and I'm gonna post this um, video up on blog.openshift.com as I do with all OpenShift com, uh, Commons briefings. And I will add in the link to that, um, that documentation. So I'll add this link um, here uh, as well into the, the one that I'm putting up with this video too, but you can always update it again. Um, this is really, um, you know, great stuff. I'm so glad to see the alerting um, in there. Because <laughs> it is, it, it's overwhelming how much information there is. And absolutely, absolutely. You don't have a way to, to segment it out and, and send it off to the appropriate people or into the appropriate channel. Um, it just, you know, it's, it's great, it's visual, it's wonderful, but it's, um, in order to make, operationalize it, you really need that um, alerting capability built in as well. So um, it's much appreciated by folks like myself. Um, and as always, when you come out with a new release, um, or if you have a customer that, or someone who's using it in an interesting way or has a great case study, let me know. And um, we'll have you back on another OpenShift Commons briefing sometime in the not too distant future. And, I hope you'll be joining us down um, in Austin at KubeCon. The day before, we're going to be doing the um, OpenShift Commons gathering again. And there will be lots of people talking about security there and um, all of this good stuff as well. So, And you as you might know, we will be there. Um, so we'll have representation there. I'm not sure exactly who from our team will be there, but we will have representation there. All right. Well, I can't imagine you not being at a Kubernetes-related event. So, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> then. All right. Um, thank you very much for this, and I'm going to pause the recording and chat afterwards.